This video is the first to discuss functional morphology, which is a suite of techniques used to infer the biology of a former living organism from the morphological features of the preserved fossil. We'll first focus on a couple of suspension feeding organisms, and so suspension feeders, or sometimes called filter feeders, obtain nutrition or food by filtering tiny particles, typically of plankton, out of the water. Um, so for extinct organisms, it's obviously not possible to observe them directly. So you're going to learn how paleontologists use physical models, use analogy with known biological solutions and even engineering solutions sometimes, and also physics principles to infer the original biological function of features in extinct species. So we'll start with a group of conical sponges called archaeocyaths. We'll see these on the field trip in, in a couple weeks. So they were common and were important reef builders during the early Cambrian and like other sponges were likely passive suspension feeders that filtered tiny plankton particles for food. So passive suspension feeders rely on the water currents in their environment rather than actively generating their own water flow. So the question is, how did archaeocyaths feed? What's the importance of the central cavity in the middle of their, their body? What's the, important of the, the importance of the septa, the vertical walls that divide their body? The septa also sometimes contain small pores, so what's their significance? One strategy that can be used to answer these questions is to construct physical models. Uh, for example, here, the, the author constructed one that was aseptate, that means it has no septa, one that has porous septa dividing the space between the inner and outer walls, and one with solid septa or aporous septa, and then place those models in moving water to observe the pattern of water flow around the body. So the experiment shows that the model archaeocyaths, at least, generate a process called passive viscous entrainment. It's a completely passive process because the water flow happens just because of the shape of the body, not because of anything the organism actually does. So basically, water flows around the organism uh, and, importantly, over the opening of the central cavity. It interacts with the water sitting inside of the central cavity, and there is a viscous interaction, or there's basically friction between the moving water over top and the still water inside the central cavity. And that viscous interaction draws water out of the top of the central cavity. So something has to replace that water. So what happens is that a current is generated that flows through the outer, por the porous outer and inner walls to bring more water into the central cavity. So this cycle continues, driving this water circulation uh, and bringing water that contains food particles through the body and ultimately out the top of the central cavity like a chimney. So why then do archaeocyaths have septa? Well, the experiments found that the aseptate model suffered from a lot of leakage, where the water seeped out of the sides rather than out of the top of the central cavity. In this illustration here, the dark patches are showing water movement indicated by, by dye. So that leakage reduced the speed of the water cycle previously described in the, in the last slide, um, and that means that less food-bearing water traveled through the body. The presence of septa reduced the amount of leakage, especially in the case where the septa were aporous or were solid, and this leads to more efficient and, and fast feeding currents. Also, the septa probably provide additional surface area um, for soft tissue to, to, to grow on, and the soft tissue contains feeding cells and other things like that. But there are trade-offs to having aporous septa. So I'll point out here that the aseptate condition is just a hypothetical construction for the experiment here because all real, regular archaeocyas have septa. So if there are pores in the septa, the food-bearing water can flow all, of, all through the organism so that all parts of it receive at least some flow, like in the middle uh, illustration B here. But when the septa are solid or aporous, uh, only the upstream part of the organism gets food-bearing water, and the part on the downstream side really doesn't. Um, so there are pros and cons to having porous septa, um, and the trade-off between those pros and cons may have different outcomes depending on the environment, the size of the organism, or other factors, and we'll investigate this more in class.
So next we'll consider suspension feeding in another group of sponges, the stromatoporoids. So stromatoporoids, an extinct group, are shown in the bottom two pictures, but they do have a lot of similarities in their overall morphology to modern sponges called sclerosponges, which are the top photos. Uh, and one of these similarities is that they often have a surface covered with little bumps called mammalons. So if we zoom in and look at one of these mammalons in detail, uh, they typically have radiating canals called astrorhizae, uh, so which converge to the top, um, and sometimes there's a small depression at the top of the mammalon. So the question then is, why does the surface of the organism have these little mammalon bumps? Uh, and what was the function of the astrorhizae? So in this example, the authors noticed that the size of the individual canals in, one of, in these astrorhizae uh, increased, or they, they got wider, towards the center, or towards the top of the, the mammalon. So what they did was they carefully measured the diameter at a variety of points from the tips of the branches towards the center of, of the mammalon along the different astrorhizae. Um, and so um, the branching pattern that they, they notice does somewhat resemble blood vessels, uh, like the arteries in, in our body, so it's possible that there are analogous physical constraints in both systems. And there is this property called Murray's Law, originally proposed um, for blood vessels and for the tubes in our respiratory system, um, and that, that basically says that the radius of a parent tube um, is equal, or the radius cubed, is equal to the sum of the daughter tube radii cubed. So Murray, who found this originally, determined mathematically that this relationship arises from a trade-off between the cost of transporting the fluid through the tubes, uh, which is lower when the tubes are large because there's less friction with the walls, um, and the cost of building and maintaining the system, which is lower when the radius is, is small. And sure enough, um, the measurements that, that these folks made of, of the stromatoporoids uh, do agree with the predictions from, from Murray's Law. So that the dots on the graph are the observed measurements, basically plotting the parent radius cubed and then the sum of the daughter radii cubed. And the line is the expected relationship one-to-one uh, -one line for, for Murray's Law. So this suggests that the asterisae were probably tubes that served for some kind of, of fluid flow um, functionality in the organism. So stromatoporoids, uh, the extinct ones, um, don't have preserved soft tissue in the fossils, but using living sclerosponges, sort of a very similar looking sponge, um, as an analog, it seems likely that the narrow um, end tips of the little asterisae probably ended in chambers filled with feeding cells, which are these coanocytes found in, in sponges. This kind of distributed feeding system, um, with many sites where food is ingested, is typical of sponges, and this actually was a quite important finding um, back when, when people were really debating what exactly stromatoporoids were. However, we can still ask the question whether the asterisae brought the food-bearing water to the little chambers with the coanocytes, or if it took wastewater away after feeding had occurred. So that question could be approached again with experimental models and from sort of principles of, of physics. Uh, the water current that flows over the mammalon um, travels a greater distance, so it must flow faster. The red line shows sort of a, a current flowing over, and the black line is one flowing around. Um, that leads to lower pressure at the top of the mammalon and higher pressure around its base from the, from the Bernoulli effect. And so as a result of this pressure gradient, water must flow up the asterisae towards the center and the top of the mammalon. So therefore, asterisae probably channeled water away from the feeding sites and not towards them. So these two case studies of the archaeocytes and the stromatoporoids hopefully give you an idea how paleontologists can use indirect methods, like constructing physical models, deriving analogies from living organisms or other biological systems, applying physics principles, to make inferences about the function of structures in extinct organisms. This type of indirect inference is a really important method 
in geology and in paleontology, so we're definitely going to hear more about these types of techniques later on and throughout this class.